Next on Max TV, we take a look at Showtime, the Marco Battle Valero. We take a look at the robbery in the desert, and we have news and notes coming up on the next round. And welcome to the next round, brought to you by Everlast. Gabriel Montoya, Steve Kim here, talking boxing. We got a big show. We begin round number one from Monterey, Mexico. It's showtime, and we have a doubleheader for the WBC lightweight title. Edwin Valero, 26 up, 26 down, takes on Antonio DeMarco with a mark of 23, 1 and 1. Kicking off this broadcast, welterweight Louis Abrego, 28 and 0, takes on the veteran Richard Gutierrez with the record of 24, 3 and 1. Gabe, let's get right into this. I am <laughs> tempted. I am tempted. I am this close to predicting the upset special of Antonio DeMarco. I think he's got the size. I think he's got the temperament. I think he has the power. And I think he's battle-tested. Here's the thing, though. Is he too much fighter for his own good? That's the thing. You talk about temperament. You know, and, and, and Antonio DeMarco is the kind of guy that if you attack him, uh, if you, you catch him a few times, he kind of reverts back to what, what his, first, you know, his, his first nature is, which is he's a fighter. You know, they've turned him over the last few fights, you know, Jose Alfaro and Andres Ajahu and the Kid Diamond fight. You've seen a progression as he's moved from, from a, more of a, a fighter uh, to more of a boxer puncher. He's kind of settled down. He's learned how to get his range. I mean, he's got a 72-inch reach for lightweight. He's 5'10". He's, he's definitely the taller guy with all the advantages. He's got some decent power and underrated toughness. The, the question is, does he have the kind of uh, mental fortitude to stick to a game plan, keep uh, Valero on the outside for all 12 rounds. I'm not so sure. Yeah, the thing about Valero, especially looking at his last fight against Hector Velasquez in December in Venezuela, he's gone backwards technically. I have not really seen the progression from a fundamental standpoint, but he has the eraser. You are not given it. You are born into it. He has natural born power. Here's the thing. He can be outboxed. He can be outmaneuvered, but you have to pitch not a no-hitter, maybe even a perfect game, and I just wonder, is Antonio DeMarco, and this is the reason why we love him, is he simply too willing to mix it up for his own good? I hate to say this, and I'm not going to say it often, he's really going to have to channel his inner smoke gainer. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, you even look at Valero, too, that w when, you, when you do extend him, you know, the time that he went the, the 10 rounds against Vincent Mosquito to win his title, uh, you know, he had Mosquito down early twice, then he got dropped himself in the third, but then he, he kept his power late, and he was able to stop Mosquito as late as the 10th round. And so, like you're saying, he's, DeMarco is going to have to pitch a perfect game, but I think they've been building to this moment over those three fights that I've mentioned. I'm going the upset special. Oh, I'm taking DeMarco. Wow by split decision. You, you have guts that I don't. I'm going to go with the chalk with this caveat. I really believe Antonio DeMarco, one thing he has to do, and if he can do it, I think he can win this fight, control the center of the ring, and really, the most fundamentally important punch in boxing, the jab. He needs to control things with that long left hand and the right hand of his, especially leading off, and really hit him with straight shots right down the middle. And if he has success against a guy like Edwin Valero, you know what the key is, Gabe? Don't get greedy. If you can land a three-punch combination, don't go for four and five. Do not leave opportunities right there. Because yeah. in the long run, you might win that battle. You're going to lose that war. But I just don't know if DeMarco can stand up to the overall power of Edwin Valero. I like Valero, but I'm just saying, I think Antonio DeMarco is a very, very live dog. In what should be a good welterweight battle, Luis Abregu, undefeated, takes on the veteran Richard Gutierrez. Gabe, I like this fight. Luis Abregu, don't cry for me, Argentina, power-punching guy, but I don't think he's a world beater. In fact, he had to get off the canvas to beat Irving Garcia last time. I think this is a very solid, appropriate test for Mr. Abregu. No, we, we talked about him the, the last time he fought. He's kind of this generation's Delvin Rodriguez. You know, he's not going to be the guy that, that, that is moving on and, and heading to the elites. He might be able to beat a lot of the second-tier guys, pick up a, a regional belt, and earn himself a title shot. But, you know, he's, a, he's an action fighter. He's a TV fighter. And Gutierrez, you know, he's, he's not exactly long in the tooth, but he's definitely got some miles on him with, you know, losses to, to Josh Clotty and, and uh, you know, Alfredo Angulo. Uh, he just dropped a, a, another one last year. Antoine he, Smith. Yeah, Antoine Smith. He, he's, he's not quite, you know, a trial horse. He's, he's not quite a gatekeeper. He's kind of in that gray area. If he can pull this win off, he can extend his career a little bit longer. I think Gutierrez is a top 25-ish welterweight, which means he's still a respectable guy. And here's the thing. We just talked about Antoine. Antoine Smith. Antoine Smith proved 
that at the very least he's an elite prospect by getting past the Richard Gutierrez with a lot less fights than Louis Abrego, who's 28 and 0. Yeah. If Louis Abrego wants to move on into being a legitimate prospect and perhaps a fringe contender, you beat a Richard Gutierrez. Folks, I think this is a pretty damn good fight. Yeah. I think both men have their moments. Once again, I will go with the chalk. I think Abregu keeps the bagel on the right side of his ledger. <laughs> I'm going to take Abregu by, by stoppage late. I think it's going to be a, a TKO, accumulation of punishment. He'll get Gutierrez going, and they'll rave it off. All right, so there you have it. Round number one. It's showtime from Monterey, Mexico. We come back. We take a look at perhaps the robbery of the year. And we are back on the next round, brought to you by Everlast, Gabriel Montoya, Steve Kim, Talking Boxing. And we move on to round number two. There is a robbery at the Hard Rock Hotel in Las Vegas for the WBA light heavyweight title. Bibet Shumanov given an absolute gift, a split decision in 12 rounds over Gabriel Campiel. Your score is 115-113. Shumanov on behalf of Jerry Roth, 117-111 on Shumanov's behalf on Patricia Morse Jarman's scorecard and Levi Martinez scored the fight 117-111 for Campillo. Um, I don't know what else to say is that if I was Gabriel Campillo, if I was his representatives, I would have gone to the hotel room. No, in fact, I would have gone ringside and dialed up 911 and called Las Vegas Metro. This was an absolute outright robbery, an absolute travesty. There was nothing controversial about this. I know who won the fight. Gabriel Campillo. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, talk about hospitality. I mean, you check into the Hard Rock and you get a free boxing lesson and a gift. <laughs> you know, I mean, just absolutely unbelievable. I mean, he, he started off strong, but it was one of those things where he was landing, you know, big shots, but they were kind of, you know, gloves, elbows, they were grazing shots. They looked more impressive, but they really weren't landing. And Campillo, talk about another guy, like almost like a Sergio Martinez, who's settling in late in his career into who he is as a fighter. Very relaxed, pinpoint shots. Uh, he, he gets off in combination. I mean, there was times where he absolutely could not miss, which was most of the fight here. I just don't see how he lost. You know, there was something very fishy about how Shumanov's people cleaned up and down. They got robbed the first time in Kazakhstan. Yet, lo and behold, in the year 2010, there was no footage of the fight. I mean, there wasn't even a beta copy. There wasn't even film strip. I, I mean, it's amazing. I can get Civil War footage, but I couldn't get <laughs> Shumanov Campillo one. But here's the thing. There may be no proof of what happened in the first fight. The whole world saw what happened this past Friday night. It was an absolute travesty. I think the WBA needs to rectify this by stepping in. And number two, Jerry Roth, Patricia Morse Jarman. You know, for everything that everyone says about Texas and Dickie Cole, how people need to be investigated, this is why Texas should not get big fights. Let me tell you something, folks. Here's the reality. Las Vegas and their usual band of suspects have been doing this much longer and much more often than any other jurisdiction and Gabe I've said it before and I'll say it again before we get to the fight these judges are more entrenched than Supreme Court justices absolutely and, you know and even in the the system where you have the promoters actually paying the judge for their services that evening the, to me that's just an absolute conflict of interest it, it needs to go away as part of our system uh, we need to get rid of a lot of these judges maybe do like the NBA or the NFL yeah. does where you, where you keep track of how badly these people do and make sure that they're never in a major fight again well, judging it Gabe that's they, they've said that that they do keep track that they do review performances they go over performances with these people individually. Here's the problem. They may do that, but I think this is so political that these people are there to the day they want to be. The fact that the certain same suspects for decades upon years have now been able to do this, I, I think really is an indictment on the Nevada State Athletic Commission. As for Campillo, I like this guy. He's a compact boxer, yeah. not a power puncher, but I'll say this. Greatest slap hitter since Rod Carew, because he slapped the you-know-what out of Shumanoff. Shumanoff, to me, came in with a lot of hype. As uh, Flavor Flav once said on behalf of Public Enemy, don't believe the hype. He's okay. The sound yeah. and the fury meant absolutely nothing. He was ineffective. The aggressiveness certainly didn't work. He got counterpunched all night. I thought Campillo clearly won this fight at least, at the very least, eight rounds to four. I, I, absolutely. Eight rounds to four, nine to three, I would not have had a problem with it. You know, and Shumanoff, he's still a younger guy. He's, he's 26. Um, you know, he's, he's got a lot of amateur background, a lot of amateur fights. Uh, there, there's something there, but but you know, as far as all the hype and, and, and he's the next big thing and you know they're going to rush to a title shot and, and, and this and that, uh, I'm just not buying it. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. And when he got in there, he just winged every shot as hard as he could. I mean, the best thing I can say about him is he's in really good shape. 
Gabriel Campillo, I think he should be treated as the victor here, whether yeah. he has a WBA title or not. You Absolutely. take a look at the landscape at 175. Chad Dawson, Jean Pascal, Tavoris Cloud. Campillo is not what I'd call a spectacular fighter, but the fact that even though he's a boxer and he's southpaw, he hangs in that pocket, yeah. he throws punches, Great and defense. he's not that hard to find, and he has very subtle defense where he's going to move his head, block punches, and counter. I, you know what? You don't really say this of tall southpaws who don't punch all that hard. But you know what? He does make for good fights. I've seen other tapes of his. He's a very effective and pretty exciting fighter in my view. Yeah, I mean, to me, that his whole, all of his experience and his style was really the difference in the fight. That, you know, Shumanoff, either he was attacking or he was moving backwards getting hit. With Campillo, he's able to sit in the pocket, pick shots off and, and counter back, you know, uh, blocking with the lead hand and, and coming back with the left. He is a, a very, very uh, exciting, not an exciting fighter to watch, but, but from a technical standpoint, yeah, he was actually very exciting. He was a guy that's, that understands his craft and is something of a master at it. Yeah, and before boxing fans, again, especially the ones out here in America, say, never go on the road, you might get robbed. You know, folks, that goes both ways. Because if you're yeah. Gabriel Campillo, you're not exactly going to be rushing to listen to Neil Diamond and come to America anytime soon. <laughs> this was a miscarriage of justice. And, Gabe, it's going to take a hell of a decision. I mean, a Dolby Shirley, uh, Eugenia Williams type scorecard to really surpass this, even as we speak on January 31st, February 1st, to have a decision this heinous. Robbery of the decade. Already? Well, we just started the decade, too. <laughs> we're it's going to last for 10 years? Yeah, well, it, it'll, <laughs> we'll see. We'll definitely see. Okay, well, that's it for round number two. The next round, we come back. We wrap it up with news and notes. And we wrap it up here on the next round. Steve Kim, Gabriel Montoya. We go to news and notes. Plenty of action on Friday night on Showbox. Chris Avalos with a TK on four over Juan Nieves. Then Archie Ray Marquez with an eight-round decision over Derek Campos. And Friday night fights in Reno, Jesse Brinkley. He was a showstopper, indeed, with a 12-round decision <laughs> over Curtis Showtime Stevens. Then from the Mohegan Sun, Peter Manfredo Jr., 10-round decision over Matt Vanda. And Matt Remillard, the sharpshooter, wins the NABF featherweight title, TKO in three over Rafael Laura. Going back up top, Chris Avalos is a fun, exciting, heavy-handed guy. We know that. I found it interesting that the broadcast team, and it was great to have Nick Charles back, but him and Antonio Tarver were discussing how fast this kid can be moved as he's ready for the elite Listen, as much as I like Avalos, I, I think to me, you are microwaving it, you're not cooking it. Avalos is fun, but I'll say this right now. Good guys that can jab, move, and counterpunch, I think can expose them to a certain degree. He's 20 years old, Gabe. What is the rush? Uh, there is no rush. I mean, they got. I think they forgot that they're on Showbox, not on Showtime <laughs> Championship Series. You know, it's settled down. It's a prospect show. And I think there is some uh, sort of growth, you know, from his uh, fight with Giovanni Caro, uh, one of his earlier fights on Showbox, where he ate way too many punches coming in and, and just wanted to trade leather until the other guy went down. In this fight, I mean, he's still, his defense isn't great. He's very stiff. Uh, you know, his head movement's not quite there. And I think anybody with a jab is going to give him trouble especially somebody with height with a jab. But, you know, by the same token, he's an exciting fighter. He's got a lot of power. There's a lot of potential there, but I still see somebody that's very raw. Yeah, absolutely, raw. Rawer than sushi from a defensive standpoint. You talked about the stiffness. Not a lot of fluidity in the upper body in terms no. of being able to slip and then being able to counter. I think he's a very, very exciting prospect, but exciting does not always equate to being seasoned. I think there's a huge difference. Again, yeah. guys, He's not even able to buy beer legally at 7-Eleven unless he has uh, one of those fake IDs. But I don't want to get into that. But I think Avalos is a guy, plenty of time left. And you look at what's at 118. I think this is as deep a division you're going to see at 118 in a very long time. Yeah. Everyone knows how good Hozumi Hasegawa is. Yeah. We all know how tough Yanni Perez is. And Selmo Moreno, to me, is the sleeper of that division. Then Abner you have Morris. guys like Nonito Donaire who's going to move up very soon. And then Abner Morris. So if you're kind of like searching out the career of Chris Avalos and you want to guide this, I have to tell you, I'd go much closer to the speed limit than I would shifting into overdrive. Oh, absolutely. All those guys are boxer punchers, you know, they're, or they're, they're pure boxers who are going to move around a lot. They're basically all the styles that are going to give trouble to Chris Avalos. And you got uh, 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 Zumi Hasegawa, who's a great southpaw, but he also can punch and move. Uh, I would not rush to these guys at all. You want to just kind of feast on the next tier, you know, uh, build up your fan base on television and polish those skills. I mean, I've watched him in the wild card. He, he stopped by. Uh, yeah. I happened to be there one day. And, and you know, the, the guy, he likes to stand and trade. And you don't really see them stopping him and saying, look, 
These are the, some defensive moves. These are things. This is called slipping a punch. You need to move, you know, this side, this way or that way. Or this is called blocking a punch. He's still just kind of coming right in and using his youth and his strength, and that's only going to get you so far. But he does have God-given power. Yeah. He has the eraser, and he just hit right through Juan Nieves. Oh Juan Nieves did his best to cover up and find shelter. He got dive bombed, is what happened. Yeah. Uh, he basically tried to cover up and weather the storm, and he got absolutely avalanched by some hard leather. Here's a prospect that I think needs a lot of seasoning. I can't tell you I was actually impressed, but he got through with the win, got some wins. Archie Ray Marquez explodes late, scores a late knockdown. Archie Ray Marquez, to me, is a long-term project. Still needs to find his physical strength. He still looked, I don't want to say weak, looked a little bit flimsy out there. Still think he needs to find a ring identity, but again, is he a prospect? Yes, but certainly a long-range one. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, it's going to be like five or ten fights. You know, he's really got to settle in. Yeah, he, he doesn't really have his man strength yet. He, he's yeah, like he said, he's kind of gangly out there. He, he's not quite an overpower you guy. He's not quite a bo out boxy guy. Um, he's just very workmanlike right now and, and, and finding his identity. I, I didn't say he struggled finding it uh, because of who was in front of him, but it wasn't a very exciting performance. It wasn't a very passionate performance. Uh, like I, I said, about 10 fights, we'll see who he really is. And out there in Reno, Friday night fights, the only prediction that was more incorrect than mine of Jesse Brinkley getting knocked out by Curtis Stevens was unfortunately Curtis Stevens, who yeah. predicted about a 45 second knockout. And once again, you see how mental and psychological this game is. One guy was prepared for a quick, easy sprint. I think Jesse Brinkley there prepared for a marathon. And by the first mile or two, we knew what was going to happen. And Jesse Brinkley did not have the physical advantages, did not have the physical tools, but he had professionalism, steadiness, and consistency, and you saw what happened. He just picked him apart. Absolutely, experience. I mean, even that, that first round, you know, I thought maybe just the, the physical gifts of Stevens were going to eventually steamroll Brinkley. He'd already had a, a you know a swelling eye by the end of the first round. He was taking some big shots, but he just you know like a true experienced vet. He slowed the fight down. He boxed from the outside. He shot that jab right up the middle, and he eventually took Stevens' heart, yeah. knocking him down. You know, uh, in the midway through the fight, I, I thought it was a, it was kind of an inspiring performance to see this guy with everything against him. He's supposed to be the name that's being served up to the up-and-comer. And, it, you know, the, it was the up-and-comer that got his got, got served. Jesse Brinkley, I don't think he's a world beater. I do not give him that much of a shot against a seasoned, consistent Lucien Butte. Certainly one of the best fighters at 168. No. However, give Brinkley credit. Since being knocked out by, I believe, Spina, he's put together a pretty good run and resurrected his career post-contender. And speaking of which, Peter Manfredo Jr., 10-round decision over Matt Vanda. I was there live ringside. I'll say this. At 160, now, I think Manfredo, he may not be elite, but he's certainly serviceable. And 160, I think, fits his body type very well right now. He's always been a guy that, that seemed to me that's searching for a weight class. Yeah. You know, he was never quite, you know, 147, uh, which is what I think he competed at on the contender. Uh, and then he moved to 154, and he still didn't seem right. I think he's fought even higher than that. At like, 68. Yeah, at 68. That didn't look good either. Yeah. Maybe 160 is where he belongs. I, I think he's just kind of a workmanlike guy. I don't see him as a world beater. But he, he's the kind of guy that will give you some rounds, and it'll be a little bit of a trouble if, if you're not quite focused. And, uh, Gabe, a guy that I like, and I remember seeing him four or five years ago as Manny Pacquiao prepared, uh, excuse me, prepared for the rematch against Eric Morales. Matt Remillard, the sharpshooter. I think this kid's coming into his own. He is now 26-0, I believe. He's 23 years old. He won the NABF featherweight title. He looks sharp. Very good boxer, good solid puncher, very good hand speed, good high boxing IQ. I'll say this right now. It may be a bold statement. I think right now he beats IBF champion Cristobal Cruz. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, he's, like you said, he's a solid prospect. I, I'm excited to see him. And, and the one thing you can't teach is he's an exciting guy. He, he's going to mix it up in there. He's definitely a TV fighter, somebody to look out for. Championship fights on Saturday had him all across the globe. Mexico, WBA minimum title was on the line. Roman Gonzalez, TK on four, Ivan, Ivan Manessas. Then in Mexico, vacant a WBO super flyaway title on top rank live. Jorge Arce captures his third major belt, technical decision in sever over Engie and Coda. Then in Germany for the IBF middleweight title, Sebastian Sylvester, TKO in 10 against journeyman Billy Lyle. Roman Gonzalez, he doesn't get a lot of credit because he's a small guy. In fact, the smallest weight division in boxing. But pound for pound, if you want to put together a list of brutal punchers, he has to be in there. Yeah, this guy, yeah, he's got lead, you know, both of his hands, the anvils in there. You know, I, I don't know in, in terms of the, the polish of the skills, but he, he's, you know, he's a serviceable boxer, but that power, that makes him exceptional. And when you say anvils in his hands, no, Javier Capetillo does not work his corner. <laughs> also, Jorge Arce, here's the thing about Jorge Arce. If you stand right in front of him and let him fight in a phone booth, he's still 
fairly effective. Yeah. It's from the outside where the loss of reflexes and speed really starts to show. But Angie Ancoda, I thought, was built to order. He was served up there as a guy where you can beat him, you can look good. He's not going to fight far from the outside. And I know that they had fought at the approximately the same weight the last three years. Jorge Arce really looked that much bigger and stronger. Than yeah. Angie Ancoda. Yeah, he really did. You know, and I actually went with the upset special with that fight in my picks just because I, I didn't think Arce has that much left. He's starting to lose to the second tier guys he did in his last fight. Yeah. But you know, he, he had just enough. And like you said, the guy was made to order. It was a top ranked card. They're going for a belt. Of course, he was in with a guy that he was just going to overpower. Yeah, I just get the sense. And a lot of people saying, what does Arce do now with that WBO belt? I think he's babysitting it for Protected. another top ranked fighter. No, no Nito Donaire, in my opinion. I think there's a top ranked versus top ranked fight. You got the Filipinos, you got the Mexicans. I know Bob is trying to do the split Pinoy power Latin Furies. Yeah. That's my personal opinion. But do I think Jorge Arce's days as an elite marquee fighter are over? Folks, I think they've been over for about one year. Uh, yeah. And Sebastian Sylvester, TKO and 10 over Billy Lyle. Gabe, I gotta be surprised. I'm telling you, I'll be honest. I'm surprised it took that long. Yeah, uh, Billy Lyle, you know, he's, you know, uh, no disrespect to the guy, but, you know, he's there to kind of give you a few rounds and then get knocked out anymore. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what Sylvester did. But, yeah, I, I thought he'd blow him out a little bit sooner. So Sebastian Sylvester goes on to his mandatory contender in uh, Roman Carmaz and taking a look <laughs> at the fight preview. Friday night fights, Glenn Johnson takes on Yusef Mack in an IBF 175-pound eliminator. Also on that card, the very talented Cuban Guillermo Rigondo. On Showbox, Francisco Contreras and Freddy Hernandez co-headline. Then Saturday night at the Newark Prudential Center, Thomas Adamek takes on Jason Big Six Estrada. Then on Top Rank Live from McAllen, Texas, Brandon Rios takes on Jorge Tarrant. Some interesting fights here. Glenn Johnson's been one of my favorite fighters. I, I think he ep epitomizes a lot of what's great about boxing and boxers. I've called him the battleship, but you know what? Against Chad Dawson, I got for the f sense for the first time, this battleship's in dry dock. Yeah. He may have turned old. You know what? I hate to do this. I think Yusef Mack, I think his speed and most of all his youth win this fight. Yeah, watership down. It's, it's yeah, <laughs> he's taking on water, you know. Uh, Yusef Mack, you know, he had that, that big win against Chris Henry. It was an upset special, and, and he's just kept on rolling ever since. And, and I, I think this is a guy that's coming into his own. He's almost kind of the new Glenn Johnson in a way. He's, you know, workmanlike guy. He's not that flashy, but he gets a job done. He's very consistent in the ring. And Glenn Johnson's just starting to slow down and slow down. And guys that are volume punchers, you know, generally don't last as long as Johnson has. It speaks to how hard he works in the gym, the, the, the kind of shape that he stays in year-round, but I, I think his time has passed. It's like that classic old commercial, Gabe. You've sunk my battleship. And <laughs> if he loses this fight, I think it is time for him to call it a day. And Guillermo Rigondo, um, unproven, but I'll say this, talented guy. This guy could be a prodigy. And if there is a Cuban that could really make a splash at the world-class level early, and I know Yuri Gamboa is at that step, but I'll say this. When I covered the 2000 Olympics live ringside in Sydney, Australia, an Olympic game that had Ricardo Williams, Jermaine Taylor, <clears throat> Samuel Peter, Miguel Cotto. Uh, I thought by far, as an 18-year-old kid, I thought Rigondo was the most talented guy I saw there. Yeah, I watched him uh, over nine rounds at the wild card this past week. And, you know, it, it, the guy is a prospect, but he has 374 amateur fights. Uh, you know, he's fought at the top level internationally. And to, to watch him, usually I'm an offense guy, and that's what you kind of want to watch when you're watching some sparring. Basically, he was defensive for nine rounds, and I came away thinking I had just witnessed a master working his craft. I mean, he, he's kind of hypnotic the way he moves. There's not a lot of offense, but the footwork is, is unbelievable. It, it's, it's very different from anything I've really seen. He was doing diagonal stepping past his opponent and then spinning him around and, and popping him with shots. It's really something to see. Yeah, the question is, can Freddie Roach bring out the offense? A lot of these Cubans, especially the ones with the prodigious amateur marks, they're great defensively, and with that amateur system, they're great at playing the Dean Smith offense, the four corners. Mm -hmm. They don't take a lot of risk. In the professional game, if you really want to make it big, yes, you can do some defense. You've got to have some offensive stylings also included in your repertoire. <laughs> Taking a look at Francisco Contreras, I don't think people know much about him. He's about 13-0, 12 knockouts. He's been described as a Mayorga type. I actually got to see him in Houston a couple of months ago. He's a fun guy. He's a little bit raw, a little bit unrefined, but Gabe, Everybody loves a puncher. Yeah, and he really is a puncher. He's got the pretty legitimate power, at least for the level that he's at. We'll see if it levels off as he moves on up. But, again, another exciting TV fighter. And, yeah, everybody, especially myself, loves a puncher. And Freddie Hernandez is on the show, but this is why we have Showbox for young kids like Contreras. Gabe, April 24th, it's going to be a hell of a night in the Ontario Citizens Business Bank Arena. 
Thomas Adamek against Chris Ariel. I can't. Oh, wait a minute. There's a problem, though. Jason Estrada hasn't cleared off on this. I'll yeah. say this right now. I'm not going with the upset special. Jason Estrada is a competent guy. He's a more natural waltz weight. He's been the distance overseas. I don't think this setting affects him at all. He's an East Coast guy. Adamek, I expect to win the fight. I want to say this right now, though. It's a tough fight. Yeah, it's definitely a tough fight. Uh, you know, Jason Estrada is not, no slouch. I mean, he's 30 years old. Uh, he's a tall guy. He can he can definitely move. And, and, you know, I wouldn't say he's a puncher, but he's the kind of guy that hits solid enough to kind of get your respect, at least over the long run. Uh, I think this is going to be a, a distance fight. He's the, he's the more natural heavyweight, and I don't care how much Thomas Adamek weighs right now. And not only that, Estrada comes with a very good amateur background, yeah. having represented our country in the 2004 Olympics. Listen, if the fight with Areola on HBO is on the line, this was the time to recycle Bobby Gunn again, mm -hmm. not Jason Estrada. So in one respect, I question main events' decision. But on the other hand, from a fight fan's perspective, I actually think this fight does have some intrigue. And uh, Brandon Reels, Jorge Toronto, I expect it to be a good fight. You know why? Because Brandon Reels is involved. Brandon yeah. Bam Bam Reels. There's not a lot of finesse, but there's going to be a lot of letter thrown a lot of leather caught. Yeah, when your name is Bam Bam, you know, there's not a lot of, <laughs> lot of finesse involved. Yeah, Bam Bam brings it. You know, every time I see him, you know, the guy gets a little bit better, a little bit better. But he's, you know, at the, at the core of him, he's just an action fighter. He loves to get in there and get inside and, and mix it up. And I expect to see more of the same this weekend. And we wrap it up with tidbits and one big news note. Floyd Mayweather, Shane Mosley have reportedly agreed to a May 1st fight at the MGM Grand. Okay, before we start booking our flights and our hotels, let's make this very clear. <laughs> Shane Mosley has signed. Floyd Mayweather, as we speak, February 1st, right around 10.15 a.m. Pacific time, has not signed. Now, we expect him to sign. We don't think there's any reason why he shouldn't. But I think this for Floyd Mayweather and Shane Mosley, whether they painted themselves into a corner, whether they had no other options, you know what, folks? Give him credit. They made the fight, and I think for the first half of 2010, if this becomes a reality, and I expect it will, and I think you do too, yeah. give them credit. I think it's the most significant fight of 2010 for the first half. Absolutely. It's definitely the most significant fight. You've got the, the guy that everybody calls the best welterweight in the world, you know, not named Paul Williams. Uh, against the linear welterweight champion returning uh, you know, back to where he won his title, and, and they're getting it on. This is a very significant fight. It's a, an action fight. Like you said, who cares about who was ducking who, yeah. the toothache, the, the family vacation, whatever. The fight is here. It's an exciting fight. And, you know, Floyd is, whether he meant to or not, moving the sport forward in a sense. That They both have agreed to the blood testing yeah. that, uh, that Manny Pacquiao would not agree to. And, and they're looking to clean up the sport. Whether, you know, wh whatever you think those reasons were in the Manny Pacquiao fight, it's here. It's happening. And I, I think if Floyd wins, he's a front runner for fighter of the year already. Yeah, and if people want to rip Floyd for whatever reason, listen, rip him if he was going to fight Pauli Malignaggi or, or Nate Campbell or Jose Luis Castillo the third time. I yeah. just, just give the guy credit. No matter what you think of him, he's taking on Shane Mosley. Now, you can also say Shane Mosley hasn't fought in a year and a half. You know what? That's not Floyd Mayweather's fault. Last I yeah. checked, Floyd Mayweather's job was to kind of run his own career. Yeah. And whether Shane Mosley wanted to take this whole year off and <clears throat> do whatever, that's the thing. I think it's a significant fight. I think the way you salvage this whole fiasco that has been Pacquiao Mayweather, hopefully March 13th, in this sense, Manny Pacquiao doesn't get upset. Then you have Shane Mosley, Floyd Mayweather. And if Mayweather looks impressive against Mosley, and I actually think he wins this fight fairly easy, hmm. believe it or not, I think if you have the fight in the second half of 2010, bygones will be bygones. And the public that was turned off, trust me, they'll come back in mass to Pacquiao Mayweather. Absolutely. That's, a, that's an action fight, you know, because Manny Pacquiao is involved, you know, and you've got, you know, it's almost like, uh, the, you know, the, the 2000 Rams against, you know, the Ravens that won yeah. the Super Bowl thereafter. Get the best offense against the best defense. Everybody wants to see that fight. But, you know, I, I'm reserving the right to make a pick in the Floyd-Shane fight. I, I think there's a lot to go over there, and uh, there's other shows in the future for that. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's it for this week's edition of TNR. On behalf of Gabriel Montoya and the rest of Max Boxing, till the next round, goodbye, everybody.